Hey, Keurig coffee drinkers, need a cold coffee with a bold flavor? Dunkin' Cold K-Cup pods were specially crafted for cold coffee. Brew over ice straight out of the Keurig coffee maker for smooth, delicious Dunkin' taste you know and love. Find your next Dunkin' Cold coffee in the roasted coffee aisle. If you need to hire, you need Indeed. Indeed is your matching and hiring platform with over 350 million global monthly visitors according to Indeed data and a matching engine that helps you find quality candidates fast. And Indeed doesn't just help you hire faster. 93% of employers agree Indeed delivers the highest quality matches compared to other job sites according to a recent Indeed survey. With Indeed, everything hiring is all in one place and it makes it so easy. Leveraging over 140 million qualifications and preferences each day, Indeed's matching engine is constantly learning from your preferences. The more you use Indeed, the better it gets. Join the more than 3.5 million businesses worldwide that use Indeed to hire great talent fast. And listeners of this show will get a $75 sponsored job credit to get your jobs more visibility at Indeed.com slash podcast. Just go to Indeed.com slash podcast right now and support our show by saying you heard about Indeed on this podcast. Terms and conditions apply. Indeed.com slash podcast. Need to hire? You need Indeed. Everyone in podcast listening land. I'm Karen Devaney. And I'm Ann Barner. And, and we're, we're sisters. sisters. Welcome to Sugarcoated Murder, where we'll discuss and probably inappropriately laugh about and comment on. Yep. One of our favorite subjects. Murder. murder. Oh, and we love to bake. And why not combine our two favorite subjects? Baking and killers. Well, howdy, Karen Devaney. Hey, Ann Barner. I see you're in my kitchen. It's a beautiful day outside. It's what a the great heck are day you to me? wake up in your kitchen. I mean, I didn't wake up in your kitchen. You did That's not. just weird. That is weird. I'd be pissed off if I woke up in your kitchen. That I'd be pissed off if out. you woke up in my kitchen, too. <laughs> <laughs> I'd be like, what the hell? God. Now, if I woke up and you were in my kitchen, I wouldn't have a problem with that because mm. that means you're baking something. Right. But yeah. if you were in my kitchen, that's not what it would mean. Wait. If you woke up and I was in your kitchen, yes, then that means I'm baking in your kitchen. No, you'd just be standing there mad, wondering when the hell well, I was getting up. I'd be trying to figure out the damn coffee maker. Right. <laughs> That's what I'd be doing. Anyway. Listen, speaking of coffee makers, I'm very seriously considering switching my coffee maker. I've always done auto drip. I've always done it in a in a canister that's like a thermos. Yes. I'm seriously considering switching over to the percolator. Girl, you got to get in on the percolator world. I mean. They make some good coffee. Good coffee. I just I think I would love to hear that sound. The only yes. downfall is there's not a percolator that you can set a timer on. No, you can't. You can set it up the night before and just come plug it in. It doesn't take very long to brew it. Right. So um, you could do that. You could just set the whole thing up and then just come turn it on, like plug it in. Because yeah. plugging it in turns it on. Right. I mean, they might have some very fancy timer percolators out there. I just don't know of them. Right. Because they're not in my budget. Because when I search for things that are under $10, they right. come up. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm not, not in the market for some <laughs> fancy coffee maker. No, but I love my percolator. We don't percolate during the week. Oh, we just cure it during the week because oh. it's just, we're just a grab and go. We only drink one cup each right. in the morning. So it doesn't make any sense to have to percolate. Right. I enjoy a cup of coffee in the morning while I'm getting ready for work. Yeah. And then I don't, then I'm done for the day. On occasion, if it's been a really long day and I get home and I'm tired, I'll have a cup of coffee when I get home just so I can stay awake past eight o'clock. Yeah. But, okay. I'm um, staying awake past eight. That's I don't, overrated. Well, sometimes if I go to bed really early, I wake up at like 3 o'clock in the morning, can't go to sleep, and then I'm in a vicious cycle. And then it can be a cycle. That's so, true. That's anyway. True. No, I think that that's a good idea to switch over to a percolator. I I just love my percolator. Yeah. I don't know what to tell you. I do. So I have a Keurig. Right. I have a French press, right. which I love, mm -hmm. and have a percolator. Right. And now my daughter is gifting to me her very fancy coffee maker because she does not drink coffee. Oh, what anymore. kind of coffee maker is it? It's the Cuisinart that has the grinder in it. No way. Yes. Oh, you're very spoiled. I am very spoiled, and I'll probably only use that when I have company, which will be next to never. Right. But, yeah. So, 
she only uses it when we're there because a French press just doesn't is, doesn't make enough coffee for three or four people to have right. enough coffee. I'm not a big, like, I, the French press coffee is fine. I just don't like the separation of the coffee. So after I drink, then there's that gunk in the bottom. But you're going to have that a little bit with a percolator, too. Ugh. Well, maybe I'm just going to... It's not a lot of gunk. Coffee. It's not the same amount of gunk as, as the French press. That, to me, is the that's the good stuff. That's oh, the stuff that... I know, but you put cream and sugar in your coffee. I drink mine black. It's not the good stuff. Oh. It's very bitter. Well, then just stop drinking when you see the gunk. Right. Simple All right. On to what you're yeah, baking. This seems what are silly. You? It's not silly. <laughs> it's only silly because it's something I want to change, but if you well, were talking about it... it's because we've over-talked it. You've over-talked it. Okay, so what I'm baking today, <laughs> I am baking... Some pumpkin butterscotch cookies. Yum. I love pumpkin. And I love butterscotch. And I love butterscotch too. Yeah. And I know that a lot of people only like pumpkin certain times of the year, but I think that is very rude to the pumpkin <laughs> to just put the pumpkin away in a closet for eight months out of the year and get it out. Not nine months, maybe even ten months out of the year. Right. You get it, the pumpkin gets to show itself for two months and then it's done. I mean, a pumpkin... It's a, it's a, that's Americana. It is Americana. Don't put Americana in the closet. And I think what happens is people put it in the closet and then when pumpkin season comes out, they overdo the pumpkin because they hadn't had pumpkin all year. So they're yeah. like, oh, pumpkin this, pumpkin that, pumpkin this. And then they're sick of pumpkin. But that if you means, enjoyed it all through the year, you wouldn't have that year. problem. I enjoy it all year round. I'm not a huge pumpkin fan. But I like pumpkin things. I don't go crazy for the pumpkin. Right. I like certain things. I like a pumpkin bread. I like a pumpkin muffin. Right. I certainly don't mind a pumpkin donut. Right. And I like a pumpkin cookie. And I really love pairing pumpkin with butterscotch. All right. Genius. All right. So these are really, really easy and I got these out of my Bible, aka allrecipes.com. Yeah, you love that. <laughs> well, I do because I can Search for things. I can save it in my favorites. I like it. And then I read a lot of the people's reviews and notes on the recipe. And sometimes they'll say, well, I, you know, called for this, but I substitute this and I feel like it was better. Right. Or it said to bake it 30 minutes, but I baked it 27 and a half and it actually stayed moist. I mean, I really recognize that people, you know, they go to the, the trouble of putting, like, tweaking it and giving hints like we do right and so that's why i enjoy that i agree i i really value the reviews and listening to somebody that's done the baking or tried the recipe before so they can tell me what they thought the, yeah. the do's and don'ts they rate the recipe the, the uh tips and bits as yeah. it were the i enjoy i appreciate bits. that so, in a recipe yeah, i do too so um that's why i like all recipes.com because i feel like i'm not baking alone right that so, makes sense. Yeah. So anyway, this is a really easy recipe, and the way the cookies come out, they're they're like the cakey cookies. Okay. Um, like there's stuff out there like cake mix cookies. Right. And that's kind of the consistency that these are. They're very soft and um, pillowy, and and when they're warm with the butterscotch, it's yummy. So I, I started out putting my dry ingredients in. My flour, my baking soda, my baking powder, my salt, and my cinnamon into a bowl and whisked it. Delightful. Yes. And then, then what I do is I cream my eggs and my sugar. Uh -huh. And um, I, then you add in um, your oil, your pumpkin, and your vanilla. Right. And then I'm going to put the dry ingredients with the wet ingredients. And I, you have to make sure you don't overmix. Don't overmix. Don't overmix because it will dry it out. It will. And then you hand fold in. I hand fold in the butterscotch. Right. That, um, yeah, because you don't want to mix it because it'll... Well, you don't want to break up your butterscotch. Right. And you and don't, don't want to over mix your batter. Yeah. I so understand. I hand fold it. Um, that was one of the tips that I found in the comment section. Yay. So anyway, I'll be doing that. I'll be piddling around and then you put it in a, um, a 325 degree oven. So, and you use parchment paper with this recipe, which I appreciate. So um, while I'm doing that, why don't you tell us about a murder? I'm going to tell you a terrible tale. Oh, no. A terrible tale. I'm telling you it's terrible. Well, T T T T T. <laughs> <laughs> so this is a, a story um, of the story of Kate Waring. Kate Waring grew up in a prestigious neighborhood in Charleston, South Carolina, known as the Battery. Um, anytime people talk about Charleston, a lot of times they'll, to, 
refer to the battery or they'll call it Rainbow Row. It's our little part of town, downtown, where they have the beautiful different colored houses and it sits right close to the waterfront. Um, and it's very pretty, but it costs a pretty penny to live in that area. That's what I call the high rent district. High rent district, yeah. She was a debutante, as are a lot of people in that area. Um, and she had a fiery heart and she had fallen on hard times. Oh, dang. She partied a little too much in college. Hey, no judgment here. She dabbled a little in drugs. There's some judgment here. She had lost her license from a DUI. A little bit more judgment. But she really wanted to get her life together. And I support that. She wanted to get her head on straight, and she wanted to figure out where she was headed in life. And everybody deserves to be able to do that. Yeah, so she was fortunate enough that she was able to move home and live with her parents while she was figuring things out. Okay. She continued to struggle, but with her parents' guidance, she began to feel more like the girl she had once been. So one day, her dad offered her the trip of a lifetime. He told her she could go anywhere she wanted to go with him, and he would pay for it, all expenses. Damn, that's really I nice. know. I wish somebody would ask me that. Yeah. Well, I mean, I guess it depends on the person, but... It'd be nice to have that offer, especially from a parent. I'm just saying. No pressure, Mama. No pressure, ma pressure Mama. So, um, Kate had always, always wanted to go to the Arctic. She wanted to see the polar bears in the wild. Okay. So, her dad booked a trip for her, um, and he and Kate got to go and experience her dream. That's fine. They went on a cruise yeah, and parents. Kate really started to feel like her troubles were behind her. Aww. While she was on the cruise, she whilst. even met whilst she was on the cruise, she even met herself a little Russian sailor. Oh my. He worked on the ship and she quickly started to learn some of the Russian language. Oh, that's fine. And she found a new love. Um she found a new love and that was all things Russian. She okay. liked her Russian boyfriend, she liked to learn about the culture, the art, the language. I'm just saying I don't mind Russian tea. I, I enjoy Russian I enjoy tea it. myself. So I can understand her. I get it, yeah. yeah. So uh, she looked into the country's history, she studied language, the culture, and after a few months, um, after she got home a few months later, she decided she was going to take a trip to Moscow. So she went to to Moscow and she met up with her little her little Russian, Russian friend man. and um, she wanted to get to know him better and she wanted to see all the things that she had been reading about in her research of the country. That's so fine. Good for her. Yeah. She was transformed. Hmm. She was consumed with all things Russian. Okay. Yeah. So she returned home to Charleston and she made a plan. Her plan was that she was going to go back to Moscow, take up Russian studies as a student, and then she was going to see where that letter led her. But she was very passionate about it. So That's she really so was excited. She had a plan. She was getting her life together. She had a passion. Yep. So unfortunately, she hit a little bit of a paperwork. She had been to Moscow. Her, her visa had run out. She had to come home. And then something went wrong with some of the paperwork that she did to get her new visa. Um, so she needed to go and get that straightened out, and she took a train to Washington, D.C. Because um, she felt like if she went in person that maybe she could figure out what the problem was and that she would be able to get that visa and go back to continue her studies in Moscow. Um, it was a beautiful day in May when her train pulled out of um, Union Station, and uh she didn't, she was, unfortunately, she didn't get the visa. She needed more time to get some things straightened away. But she was upbeat and excited even when she left Union Station because she knew there was hope. Okay. She went back to Charleston and um, started taking some classes. She was even writing a children's book. Oh, look at her. Yeah, so she was super happy. So, on the 13th of June, Kate's dad thought it was really kind of strange that he hadn't heard from her. He and Kate's mother were out of town at their summer home, just outside of Charleston. You know where my summer home is? It's the same place. Same place. <laughs> yeah, mine too. Yeah. I summer at home. Oh. 
Yeah. <laughs> some, are, some are at home too. Yeah. The only difference is I, I turn the air conditioner down a little bit more. Yeah, that's it. That's all. Mm -hmm. So they decided to go back to Charleston and check on her. Um, everything in the house looked normal. It looked like Kate had gone out somewhere, but maybe but was planning to come back. Given Kate's history, her parents worried that she had started maybe partying again, but they they were worried, but they weren't too worried. They weren't they weren't like completely freaking out, saying, oh my God, we've got to call the cops. Right. They're just concerned. Right. So um, they waited a couple days, and then they went back to the house because they still hadn't heard from her, and there was still no Kate. So they started calling the hospitals. They called the detention centers, thinking maybe she got arrested. Nobody had heard from her. There was no sign of her, and um, they were really worried. But they decided that they were going to give it one more day because it was the weekend. So after the weekend, Monday comes, and on Monday morning, Kate's father gets a call from the bank, from Kate's bank. Mm -hmm. Someone had tried to cash a check for $4,500 from Kate's account. Boy. And the bank manager said he felt like the check had been forged. Oh, wow. Um, Kate and her dad had recently discussed a check in the amount of $500 that had caused her account to overdraw. The check had been made out to a friend of hers named Ethan, um, but Kate wouldn't discuss anything about the check, why she had written the check, nothing, mm -hmm. and she just told her dad that she was going to handle it. So her dad was already on high alert, and now he's getting this call, Ugh. like, here's somebody trying to cash a $4,500 check. Something's not right. Yeah. So after the call with the branch manager, Kate's dad immediately called the police. Um, unfortunately... Missing persons are not a top priority unless a crime has been committed. The Warings became very frustrated and hired a team of private investigators. After a few months, there was still no sign of Kate, but both the police and the private investigators were focusing on Ethan, his, on her friend Ethan. His name was Ethan Mack. So he's the one that tried to cash that $500 check yeah. that caused the problem with Kate's bank account. As a matter of fact... Ethan, Kate, and another friend, Heather, had all been to dinner on June 12th at a Japanese restaurant in downtown Charleston. Mm. Ethan and Kate had been friends for years. Heather and Kate had met back in May when she had been on that train trip to D.C. to try and work on her visa. Okay. And then Kate had introduced Heather and Ethan. So Ethan and, and Heather had become romantically involved and um, the trio hung out together frequently. All right. By late September, police had arrested both Ethan and Heather oh. for the check forgery and for lying to the police during the investigation. So a week later, the investigators that Kate's dad hired found Kate's skeletal remains. Oh, no. Yep. Kate's family recalls meeting Heather and warning Kate that maybe she was trouble. They just got a really bad feeling about her the first time that they met her, and they did not like her. They thought she was trouble. So when Kate's mother first met Heather, Heather told her that she had relocated to Charleston because she needed a new start after losing her son to leukemia. Oh. Heather said she was a pediatric burn specialist. Oh, and gosh. she was working at MUSC, which is a local hospital here in Charleston. Heather told Kate that her son had been killed in a car accident. Kate's mom could see trouble, but Kate just saw a friend. She really didn't believe anything that this girl, Heather, was saying. She just didn't find the story believable, and she thought something's not right. So in June, Kate had gotten into an argument with Ethan and Heather, because someone had been using her credit cards without her permission, oh, and she suspected it had been one of them. Now that Kate's body had been found, Heather started to kind of freak out. Um, she panicked, and she told police she would tell them what happened to Kate, but only if they agreed to a plea deal for her. And they did. So on the night of June 12th, Kate, Heather, and Ethan left Heather's, uh, went to Ethan's house after they had dinner, downtown and they they said that Kate had been drinking and she was a little bit drunk 
As the three of them were hanging out, Ethan challenged Kate to see if she could fit into a suitcase that was on the floor. And let me just say, if you're in somebody's house and they say, hey, I bet you can't fit in that suitcase, don't get in the suitcase. It's just not going to turn out. It's not going to be okay. Um, Kate was the athletic type and she was competitive, so she accepted the challenge. Um, as Kate situated herself in the suitcase, Ethan pulled out a stun gun. Kate became annoyed with Ethan, thinking that it was part of the challenge. Ethan began jolting Kate, which caused her to struggle. So then he hit her in the head with a wine bottle several times, rendering Kate unconscious. That's not nice. That's no. not what wine bottles are for. It's not. It is not. It's not nice at all. Do not hit anybody with a wine bottle unless it's in self-defense, unless... It's That's just it. really bad wine. <laughs> self-defense is it. Okay. That's it. That's Nothing fine. else. We'll, so we'll keep it at self-defense. Yeah. So, naturally, Ethan and Heather close the lid on the suitcase, drag it to the bathroom. Heather fills the bathtub with water. She and Ethan put Kate in the water where she drowned. She was still alive. She was still alive. Okay. So Just unconscious. Okay. So, let's just say some rules for life. Don't ever accept the challenge of getting into a suitcase. Right. Even if you trust the person telling you to. It's just not a good idea. Suitcases are not for people. No. They're for travel. Travel. With people. With. They're to take people's things. But <laughs> yes. They're not for people. Not suitable challenge, for people. Not accepted. <laughs> right. Exactly. And then what that leads to is head assault with a wine bottle. Right. Not nice. Right. And then and stun gun. A stun gun and then a drowning in a tub. Yeah. Not a good idea. That's just I don't like them. No, and what really irritates me these is These are that her friends. These are her friends and she introduced them. I mean, yeah. good heavens. They're so not anyway, very grateful. Not they called, very gracious. No. They called a friend of theirs over the next day and asked for help loading Kate's dead body. Wait, they told that friend? It was a dead body? Well, they said, we need your help getting something into the trunk. Okay. Um, it's in the suitcase, and don't look in it. Don't look in that suitcase. <laughs> Whatever you do. I don't think they put her back in the suitcase. I think don't? they just took her out of, the, out of the bathtub, wrapped her up in something, stuck her in the trunk of call the car, and then they took her body over to Wadmalawa Island, which is oh my gosh, not too that's far. That's so pretty. Yeah, and they dumped her in a wooded area. Oh. So, Ethan then tells police it was Heather that killed Kate, because, I mean, why not? Yeah. Yeah. Heather blamed Ethan. Of course. Ethan blamed Heather. Yes, because they're so trustworthy with Kate, they're totally going to be stabbing each other in the back. Right. But listen, it, it's infuriating to think this poor girl is, has gone missing. Her parents are frantic. She calls the police. The police's response is, well, a crime hadn't been committed, so it's not going to be top priority. That's just so dumb. Because how do you know a crime hasn't been right. committed? Right. If somebody's missing, it could be a crime. Right. Yeah. That is the crime, you <laughs> deputy dog. Right. So they hire these private investigators, yeah. and they're the ones that actually found the body. Yeah, I would they're the ones that got right up to that police barracks and said, listen. Y'all are all fired. Right. And you're all voted off the island. Get out. Bye bye. Get out. Get out of my life and my circle and my sight. Right. So, if it hadn't been for those private investigators, they might not have ever found her. Exactly. Exactly. So, um, as part of her plea agreement, Heather ended up pleading guilty to involuntary manslaughter. Yeah, because I involuntarily, don't even get me started. Right, but she also got charged for forgery, so that's going to add to her sentence. And But um, I wonder how much it adds. I'll tell you. Well, I'm going to need to know I'm that. I'm going to tell you. Okay. So she also told some lies in her confession to the prosecutor. Imagine um, that. And that kind of pissed the prosecutor off, so they threw out the plea deal. Oh, yeah. Ha, freaking ha. <laughs> what you get, you little lion hoe bag. Right. So she was convicted and sentenced to 45 years in prison. Yeah. 30. They check writing lion dirty down low hoe bag. She got 30 years for the manslaughter charge, 15 years for forgery and obstruction of justice. Oh my gosh. So what was the total amount? 45 years. Not enough. 
I I tend to agree. That's just my opinion, though. I it, I mean, I'm sure the jury had a difficult time making the decision. Okay, we'll leave it at that. Ethan, oh, Ethan boy. But my arms are crossed. I understand. I see <laughs> what your body language is saying. It's not matching the things coming out of your mouth. No. No. So, um, Ethan decided, I'm going to take the Alford plea. Right. I know. Why? Why? Which says, the Alford plea is like, okay, I am going to say that there. I understand there's enough evidence to convict me. I know things look really bad. Right. I'm going to just admit things look really bad, but I'm not going to admit my guilt. Right. So, then he gets 25 years. <gasps> right. And then he gets 15 years for the forgery. So he gets 40 total. Right. Which is only five years less. But But the question is, are those sentences running concurrently or consecutively? Oh, yeah. Yeah. That I don't know. Sometimes that happens, and that really burns me up. Yeah. I didn't think to look at that. Yeah. That really chaps my ass when they pull that shit. I agree. I think they should be gone for life. I think if you take a life, then you should be in jail for life. At, at the very least. So, um, yeah. yeah. Well, that I mean, is I just, a sad story. It's a sad wearing. story on a lot of different levels. But the, here's a girl that really didn't have any direction in her life. Right. She took this life-altering trip with her father. Yes. And then her life had meaning. It did. And she had goals. And she was working hard at those goals. And then, because she's nice, she meets these two assholes I know. And they befriend her on a terrible trip. Well, she had been friends with Ethan for a long time. Okay, it, but then she meets that maniacal bitch Heather. Yeah, on the train. She's the fake check writing, dirty, yeah. low down lion. Yes, ho-bag. she was not a burn nurse at MUSC. She did not have children. She did not lose a son in a car accident. She did right. not have a son that died but from because leukemia. Heather was Heather. Uh, Heather's the bad one. Yeah, she's bad. It's Kate. Kate's Sorry, the one. Sorry, Kate, because Kate was trusting. Yes. And because, you know, I mean, you, you can't have too many friends. Right. So, and and sh- this girl was a friend of her friend, Ethan, so a friend of your friend is your friend. Right. Here's the crazy thing. But guess what? The killer, the friend of the killer that kills you is usually the killer, too. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> I don't even know what you just said. I don't know either, but it made so much sense. In Did my it? Head. Yes. <laughs> I feel like there's some kind of a, somebody needs to write that down really quick and turn it into a law. That might be the answer to the, the whole universe, the universe question. I just solved all the problems. Yeah, I think you might have. Yes, I can't. Don't ask me to repeat it because I cannot. We'll have to listen again to this podcast Probably and remember what it times was. And write it <laughs> Wait, down what did you say? <laughs> what the hell was you saying? Yeah. Well, here, here are some takeaways that I got. Number one. It's really good to have a system in place where you check on your children. Yeah. You know, nobody needs to be alone. You should have a, a plan. We're going to talk, you know, and once a did, week. And they did talk to her. And right. they knew something was wrong. But the flipping police dragging their asses. Yeah, but imagine if they had been estranged. You know, you yeah. just wonder. So I think that's always a good thing. It Another is takeaway is don't get in a suitcase. I mean, Never. there's just no reason for anybody to get in a suitcase. No. Don't don't even don't ask a person to get in a suitcase. Don't do that because even if you think you're coming from a good place, it's not going to be a good <laughs> no. place for them. No. I mean, you could throw out your back or break a hip. I mean, it's just something, not a good idea. It's not. It's not a good idea. It's not a game. No. Don't go or to some party that we're like, going to play the. Suitcase game. No, we're not. No, we're not, <laughs> we're not play playing that game. That. The right. game I play is put my shit in it and leave. Right. That's the game I play. So, and don't, like, a, a Rubbermaid bin. No. Don't. Don't. Don't, eat, don't even get in a steamer trunk. Don't do it. Don't get in a steamer trunk. Mm-mm. Mm-mm. Not if, even if somebody's like, I'll bet you $5,000, and they show you $5,000, yeah. you should just grab the money and run. Don't actually get in the suitcase. I agree. Or the Rubbermaid bin. Or the bin, or... Mm-hmm. Any of it. Don't. No. Don't. Don't even let your friends wrap you in bubble wrap. No. Don't do anything that takes your your way to control the situation away. It's such a good idea not to do that. You have to have some type of control. So I hope everybody is teaching their very small children from a very young age. Suitcases or for traveling with your crap in it. Don't get in. Right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So that's good. Yeah. 
Well, so anyway, that's, that's another local yokel murder. A local yokel. Yeah. So anyway, my kitchen is starting to smell. Yes, the so cookies are delicious. in the oven and they're baking. They have about three and a half more minutes and then they come out. They cool for about three minutes on the pan and then you remove them to a cooling rack. Did you put them on a pan, like one great big pan so that you only have to bake it once? No, because that was not available <laughs> in this kitchen. Are you sure? I'm more than positive. Uh, somebody needs to come up with that. Offer to me. A ginormous they baking pan. They have them in really big kitchens. Oh, right. right? They go in really big of that. I understand, but if they made a big, wide, wide one, a wide, a wide one mouth for pan. a regular person's kitchen, I think you can get large, larger cookie sheets than yeah, what has been made available if to it me makes today. Two dozen. Let me put 24 damn cookies on my sheet. I Stick agree. it in there. I do the wish day. that that was the case, but yeah. that is not the case here. So while I'm speaking of murder, you'll be shuffling some cookies around. Damn it. Yes. That's All right, girl. well then let's do it. I'm okay. going, we're going to take a little quick breaky poo. We're going to switch seats. Yeah, we I'm don't even, I mean, you don't even have to pause it because I can just shuffle my ass over there. Well, shuffle on, girl. Come on now. Shuffle your ass right shuffle. on Shuffle. I'm going to shuffle every day. I'm shuffling. Shuffling, shuffling. Shuffling, shuffling. I don't know what this get up is, <laughs> but I have to see my way around it. <laughs> so... I am going to talk about some really interesting things because my murder takes place in Canada. Oh, Canada! Don't do that because we have Canadians that listen to us and they've now been offended and we've lost them as Almost listeners. Almost offensive. That's the beginning of their national anthem. But it didn't sound too good. Excuse you? Oh. So, okay, the reason that I'm doing this about Canada is because we have... Somebody, somebody's in Canada shout listening Canada, to us. So you. shout out to the maples or whatever you call yourselves. Okay. So anyway, I thought, oh, well, that's a fine. It's just your phone, not mine. Oh, thanks. Okay. So the one thing that I wanted to start off with was I, I would like to educate us in some Canadian slang words. Oh, right. I love it. Yeah. So that we can all feel Canadian. You know, I'm all about the slang. Yes. Okay. So, when you go into a coffee shop, and this would be me, not you, because this is not how you order your coffee. I order it with two creams, two sugars. Mm -hmm. That's called a double-double. A double-double? That's not a stutter. That's intentional. A double-double. I have a double-double. Not oi. We are not, I don't even know where oi is from. I, I don't think that there, I don't even know who says oi, but it's <laughs> not the Canadians. They say eh. Eh. That's what. And that really is a slang word, but I wasn't going to bring that one up. Thank you. Eh. Hmm. So there's also something called Loonies and Toonies. Oh, what's that? I love that. A cartoon? Nope. Okay. So in 1987, the Canadian $1 bill mm -hmm. got turned into the Canadian $1 coin. Ah. And that coin has um, the image of a loon on it. Ah. So they call that $1 coin a loony. Okay. How much is parking? It's going to cost you two loonies. Wow. But there's more. In 1996, the Canadian $2 bill became the Canadian $2 coin. Oh. That's now called a toonie. A toonie. Because it's two loonies. It's a toonie. That's amazing. That's loonies and toonies. Isn't that fun? I just thought that was so fun. Very clever. Very clever. Those Canadians. Okay, so the other thing that I saw, which I thought was interesting, is called a took. And this is, um, it's actually a hat. It's the hat that you wear in the winter. It's just like a beanie hat or like the, you know, the ski caps with the balls on them. Oh. But they call it a took. A took? Yeah. It's too hot outside right now for a took. Okay. Yeah. And what about if somebody stole your took? Who took my took? Who took my took? Don't take my take. Don't be no, a took. No, that's not right. <laughs> you took her? Oh my gosh, you're a took tooker. A took took her. I don't like that. So That'll anyway. cost you two loonies. So here's another one. They have something in Canada called homo milk. Excuse me? Well, in here, it's not very PC to say something like that. But right. there, you go in and ask, you go into the grocery store, and the cartons, milk cartons are, like, plastered with homo milk. Okay. 
Well, it's really homogenized milk. Right. They just take off the genized. <laughs> you know, <laughs> short to the point. I like that. I like the short and to the point. So they can walk in and say, hey, can you go and get me a homo milk at the store? Oh. And then stop by and get me a double-double at the coffee shop. And here's a couple loonies and toonies to cover my bill. And Booyah! Just covered all of it right there. And grab your took. Oh, yeah. And don't forget out. your took. So... There's one more thing, and it's called, it's it's Skookum. Skookum? Skookum or Skookum. I don't know. It's S-K-O-O-K-U-M. Skookum or Skookum. Okay. But it actually means fancy, exceptional, impressive. So when somebody says, you look so Skookum in that dress. Why, thank you. Don't punch them in the throat. Okay. They actually are giving you a, a Canadian compliment. Wow. Yes, and now we're in the Canadian mood. I love it. I love it too. I love it. There's lots more that I found on this website, but I won't, I shan't bore you. Not that the Canadians are boring by any means, because we love our Canadians. Have you ever been to Canada? No, and I want it. I do too. I've seen it. I think once when we were in New York. We <laughs> I think saw, we, we, we saw the checkpoint. We yeah, we were like, oh, hello, Canada, hello, but we Canada. couldn't go across. So we were way upstate in New York, and we were at a fishing camp with our boys. God save us. So it was good times right there, sugar. Good times. Okay, so I'm going to talk about this, um, this, this Canada situation. Understand. Okay. So there's a lady named, I think her name is Cheryl Dell. It could be Cheryl. Is it C H E R? That's mm -hmm. Cheryl. It's Cheryl. C H. Okay, but it's C H E R R Y, like cherry. L L E. Uh. Uh, so it's either Cheryl or Cheryl, but I'm going to call her Cheryl because that's, that's the southern pronunciation. <laughs> Cheryl. Okay, so we're in Ottawa Valley, in the area of Ottawa Valley, um, in Ontario, Canada. Okay? Okay. Cheryl, she was flamboyant in appearance and personality. Huh? She told outlandish stories about her life. Okay. She bragged about taking on um, lesbian lovers. I'm just saying. And she told really outstanding stories about her husband where she was not very nice. Maybe. Whoa, 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 wait. What? So she was a lesbian, but she had a husband? She was married. Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. You go, Cheryl. Uh -huh. You live your truth. Yep. That's what they say. So she told people um, that... Her husband was abusive to their children. So we'll get back to that. All right. She had flowing red hair ah. and um, milky white skin. Milky. Mm -hmm. Homo skin. She had homo milk skin. And she, had, uh, she was known to wear her full-length fur and high heels when she was out running errands. You know what? If I had a full-length fur... And looked good in high heels, I would do the same. I know. Well, she lived in a very hippie-ish village of 700, so she certainly stood out in the crowd. Right. Yes. She never minded putting her personal business on display. Okay? Sounds like it. Yeah. So, um, she was married to her husband, Scott Dell. It's very, it's very convenient that she was married to her husband. It's, it is. I love that that's the way they do things yes. in Canada. They were married for 21 years. They had been estranged for, estranged for four years, but there was talk of reconciliation. Oh. Yep. So, as a matter of fact, one night, they talked on the phone for nearly nine hours. Wow. As Scott sat at his desk in his farmhouse, he talked with Cheryl. Cheryl. And reminisced about the good parts of their life together. And he wrote notes as he was talking to her, and he was drinking wine. That There was a bottle of wine sitting on his desk, and he was enjoying some wine. I would like to have wine at my desk. With the fire going in your farmhouse. It was a log farmhouse. Like, it, you know, it just seems so cozy. Yeah. So she was on the other line, and she was cooing back to him, encouraging him to enjoy the wine and speak about the impending reconciliation. And um, he wrote his thoughts as they talked. One of the things he wrote was, what do you think will happen if I drink a bottle of wine listening to the music we used to listen to? I'm going to think about you and me together. Aww. 
He also wrote, I feel like holding you close to me like never before. Aww. Like he was just He really smitten. was going for it. He said, I can't help it and I don't want to want you. Aww. It was really sweet. So by about 4 a.m., he, oh. half the bottle of wine was gone. He's feeling a little groggy and he says, I got to go to bed. So as they hung up, Cheryl coos to Scott, my angel spirit will take you to heaven. Oh, oh. Very sweet. No, no, no. Yeah. That's not what you so should say at sweet. the end of a call. Yeah. <laughs> no. if, I, if I end our call like that, sugar, you might need to go run. I'm going to get the Ipecat syrup <laughs> and throw, immediately make myself throw up. Okay. Well, he hung up and went upstairs to go to bed. But he never made it to bed. Okay. He died on the floor, curled up in the fetal position next to the bed. Damn it. Yes. So let's pause right there. Got a little cliffhanger. Oh, it's a cliffhanger? Because <laughs> yeah. it seems like Just there's no cliffhanger because she said, I'm going to take you to heaven. And but she's he on dies. the phone with him. She's not with him. Well, where did he get the wine? It was on his desk in his house. Who put it there? Okay. I don't know. Anyway, let's, let's delve into some background. Okay. Scott and Cheryl... Married New Year's Eve, 1971. Okay, that's nice. Yes. He was 20. She was 17. All right. She brought with her some troublesome wild child ways into the marriage. Mm -hmm. Scott was very patient with her. He was just so smitten with her. He made a lot of excuses for her. And, you know, when, when she would say ugly things to him or about him or if she had some kind of wild behavior, he would just say, you know, it's just how she is and I love her. He was very blinded by his deep, passionate love for Cheryl. Blinded by the light. No, he's blinded by the Cheryl. Blinded by the Cheryl. Wrapped up in the, what's that word? Anybody? Anybody? Nobody knows. <laughs> <laughs> we don't want to say it because we're scared we don't know it. And we sure as hell don't know how to spell oh, it. Oh. There seems to be a phone on the floor ringing. <laughs> Maybe it's the please find me. It's not the please find me. It's the let's take a moment out of our day and say a prayer. Oh. Let's give thanks. Is it, is it time to pray? Let's give thanks for all of our blessings. Okay. I'm going to give thanks right now for something in particular. Okay. It's the fact that my daughter has finally gotten transferred from her with through her job in Florida back up to where we live in South Kakalaki and that she will be living to me close. That's very, very living to me lesson. close. Okay. You know what? I might be drunk on sugar. Thank you God for everything. Back to the murder. Amen. Okay. So they were married in 71. Okay. Okay. She's kind of young to be married. 17. That's really young. That is a young marriage. In spring of 1975, there's some marital strife. Okay. She leaves the marriage and runs off to Toronto. Oh. Also in Canada. Yeah. Thank you for that clarification. <laughs> yeah. Look at me. Geography. Genius. And she worked as a stripper. <laughs> it's fine. It's just how she is. All right, so. So, almost a year later, she turns back up and Scott takes her back, even though she's preggers. Oh, Lord. It's okay. It's how she is. So Scott embraces the daughter that she has and raises that child as his own. And that child didn't even know Scott was not her father until her late teens. Oh, wow. She, he, just, he just said, you know what? I, I love the mother of this child, so I love this child. Wow. Isn't that nice? He's a great guy. He sounds like a really nice man. Yeah, I know. Sorry. Okay. So this is where we start to get a little dicey. Okay. Just now? Just yeah. now it's getting dicey? Yeah. Okay, so she comes back in 75, preggers, okay, has this baby. And then, and he was working at General Motors at the time, and um, it's either Oshawa or Oshawa or some other version of that. I'm sorry, Canada, I suck at all pronunciations. It's true, she really does. Yeah, it ha it's nothing about Canada, it's about me being an uneducated storyteller. You're educated. You're an educated storyteller. You just are not worldly. I'm worldly. I just can't pronounce shit. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, Mr. Dell is working at General Motors from 1976 to the late 80s. 
But then Cheryl gets a bright idea, and she decides that the family needs to move to Petersboro, and they opened and operated a group home for special needs children out of their house. Okay. They cared for mentally handicapped children as well as a baby girl that they adopted in 87. Okay? That's really nice. Yes. And then in 89, the couple moved to the log farmhouse a few kilometers because that's what they say for miles <laughs> outside of the village where they were and they settled into a rural alternative lifestyle. Okay. So they operated this group home. They enrolled their older daughter into an alternative school, which was a two-room schoolhouse. I mean, this is like alternative living for us. Um, they did like local trading and bartering, you know. I mean, right. and these this town and the people that lived there had a nickname called the Kalunis. I'm the, sorry. The, the Killaloonies. Okay. Because it was Killalo was the was the place that they lived, Killalo. Okay. Um, it's a village. It's the village that had like 700 people, the hippie village. In November of that year, so they moved in the late 80s, 87, 89. They're in the farmhouse, 89, November. She gives birth to a son that was actually fathered by her husband this time. Oh, my. I know. I mean, Way to go. just comes around. Love it. I know. So the boy was born at home um, with a midwife attending. All right. In 91, they celebrate 20 years of marriage, and life is good. All right. It's not good. It's not, it's not no. good. So February of 92, Cheryl joined an incest survivors group. Incest. She survivor? was the she was a survivor of incest Aww. in her childhood, and she met a guy named Gay Doherty. Mm -hmm. Doherty or Doherty, but okay. again, I'm calling him Gay, and I'm not calling him Gay as a slang bad word. I'm calling him Gay because that's his name. Right. Oh no, Gay is a woman. Oh, for heaven's sake! Look at that. What is happening? I know. So anyway, she's a former nun. Oh. Mm-hmm. And this is. This lady um, becomes Cheryl's first lesbian lover. She had, she was a nun? She was. Okay. And she left the nunnery. Hmm. And, and she met Cheryl. Okay. And they took up as lesbian lovers. Lovers! And this woman was absolutely head over heels in love with Cheryl. She said that she had the perfect Barbie doll looks. And they were immediately attracted each other, to each other, and they became involved. Well, people just really seem to enjoy Cheryl. They do, <laughs> in, in all sorts of capacities. They certainly do. Yeah. So, that summer, they ran away together. Where'd they go? They ran away to live together. They actually, they ran away in July of 92 and took the family van and went to Toronto for a week. She loves Toronto, and it, she likes to go to Toronto and do... Weird stuff. She likes to live on the edge in Toronto. Okay. Let's just say that. But she took that van. That was the only van they had. And she she stranded her husband and her children and her foster children by sure taking her, the van. I'm sure her husband said, it's okay because yes. I just love her so much. When they returned, she wanted to move her new lesbian lover into the home. That's where Scott said, nah. Oh, Scott didn't want the lesbian lover. He said, no, no, no. He said, I've no. had enough of you. No, he said, no. So, Scott, people thought that maybe he thought that Cheryl was having just some kind of a crisis mm. and that she was just looking for herself and right. that he was just going to see her through that, but that he could not have this person living in the house. It just didn't work. Okay? Well, I get it. Yes. I get it. I mean, they've got kids. So Cheryl moves in with Gay, and she starts applying to get custody of all of the children in the Dell home, as well as the big old farmhouse. Oh, she wants so the she farmhouse says, if you kids. don't let me come live with the children and I'll my lover, take everything away. I'm just going to take everything from you well, just... and vote you off the island. Okay. Yes. So I've stepped out on our marriage. I've taken the van and stranded you. Yes. I've left you with a child that 
I had with somebody else. Yes. Somebody I adopted. Yes. Our child. Yes. And going off with my lesbian lover. Yes. And I'm still going to screw you further by trying to get custody of the children that you've been taking care of in the farmhouse. And oh, by Absolutely. the way, I'd like to take that too. Yes. Sounds great. So, and, and she actually went so far as to falsely swear in court affidavits to having a, a university degree in psychology. Okay. And she said that the Dell Farm, the big log house, the log farm house, had been bought with money she had inherited from her grandmother. Oh. This was a lie. Oh. And then she also, then when that didn't work, she started saying that Mr. Dell had assaulted her in July, and he was charged by police only to have the charge withdrawn when it was declared groundless. Oh. Two days after that, she told authorities in Pembroke that her husband severely assaulted a developmentally delayed 13-year-old boy, giving him a bloody nose and a swollen lip. Oh, my goodness. So it took the officials a week to debunk that allegation. And, um, but as a result of that claim and other complaints that Mrs. Dell lodged, the Dell foster home was ordered to close out of caution, and Mr. Dell had to go on family benefits, which yeah, I think... because he's given up his great job at the car yeah. plant. And, I mean, it, was it Michelin? Well, Shoot. Shoulda, now, why would you do this I'm to me? Sorry, why? Sorry. why would you actually think and that the, I'm going to so, have a recall? Sorry, sorry, sorry. No, I'm going to tell you now because now we got to know. He's given up a General great, Motors. General Motors. General Motors. And open this pipe yes. dream of hers, and now he's... And she wants to take it all away, and now she's taking it all away. Nobody's got any of it. Yeah, and he probably cashed out his 401k just to get them to where they are. To get the farmhouse and yeah. everything, and to take care of these children. Now, some of them were foster children, so I don't know how it happens in Canada, but a lot of times when you have foster children, you do get some money from the state to help. I mean, if they're operating this home, probably as a nonprofit, or, you know, they, they're getting money. Right. To feed these kids and to live. So in early September, she made more allegations telling child welfare officials that Mr. Dell had been rough with their oldest daughter and had sexually, had been sexually improper with his other daughter. I mean, God, at what point would the police look at her and say, Lady, Shut the fuck up. We don't think you're telling the truth anymore. Yeah. Well, they have to, every time she comes up with these allegations... They have to. I know. They have to investigate. It's very sad, and she's just using everything against this poor man. But when they debunk them, I don't understand why they can't file charges on her. False her allegations. Right. I agree. They act, so, and the daughter, one of the daughters, actually agreed with the mom. Oh shoot! But then it came out that she that she had been coached by her mother to lie against her father. Ah, uh, that is just maniacal. And at the trial, the girl said, it made me feel bad because I knew it wasn't true. Aww. Yes. Yeah, so now she's using her kids that she supposedly loves. So anyway, she continues to smear her husband. She literally has done nothing but adore her, adore her. And be very patient with her when she goes to Toronto, becomes a stripper, comes back, and shows up preggers with another dude's baby. And then ditches her for a lesbian lover. Yeah. He ditches, used to be a nun. Yeah. Yeah, this is just all sorts of just, listen to this. There are bad things happening there. She maintained that Mr. Dell had sex with one of their daughters, and she told police that he had ejaculated on one of his daughters. Oh, my god! Like, she is really pulling out the nasty, nasty. stuff. She's nasty. That's nasty. You don't even say things like that in public. Don't be nasty. She filed for divorce. She asked for custody of three of the children and then wanted her... Dear God in heaven, want, the man still has not asked for a divorce. No, no. Oh. And, so, and then she demands $4,900 a month in child support and exclusive possession of their home because she alleges that he cheated on her and abused their children. Oh, my gosh. So he sought a divorce with a counter petition, asking for custody, and asked for $900 a month in child support and the farm. And he also wanted the court order to order her to undergo a psychiatric examination. Oh, now that's the smartest thing he's done so far. No, but I also think he's still just making excuses for her really, really, really bad behavior. I understand. So... In May of 93, a judge denied her application, 
and he cited Mrs. Dell's appalling lack of consideration and concern for the interest of the infants in the prosecution of her design to destroy the respondent's reputation by repetitive and unfounded allegations of sexually impropriety to mask or mitigate her own inadequacies. My goodness. That's a mouthful. That in other mouthful. words, you're a maniacal bitch. You need to step off. A maniacal lion bitch. Step the fuck back. That's right. But it did not deter her. She ended up fleeing to Ottawa with the children and asked the Ottawa Carleton Children's Aid Society to take them in and investigate the past abuse of, from her husband. Oh, my gosh. I mean, can you imagine? the for, So, for two weeks, those child protection officials examined the children and said the children appear to be happy and relaxed and safe and healthy. Go figure. Yeah. She continues with her false allegations, and he continues to be concerned about his wife his wife's mental health. And at one point he begins to cry and said his wife had all these periods before, but she always recovered and things always returned to normal. But now there was no normal. And it seems like these little periods of her being anti adjusted are ongoing. Yeah. Sister's got problems. <laughs> So, Gay, remember Gay, the yeah. lesbian lover? In a trial in the Ottawa Valley, she said that, that Cheryl had so charmed her that she had talked her into performing bizarre rituals on a homemade doll. What? So, now they have made a homemade voodoo doll, and they're sticking pins in it, and it's Scott. Oh. Yes. So, she said that she would burn it, stick pins in it, Tie ropes and ribbons around it and then bury it. Oh. Yes. Everything's fine. She's good. We're all good. It's just how she is. Oh, yeah. But Gay said that the spell quickly wore off and the day-to-day -day dramas were so grueling that she wanted to end the relationship after three months. She oh, couldn't take it. She could. She, she said, I desperately wanted out. I felt like my life was me. being consumed by all of her needs and I, I got to get out of there. She said, I thought being a nun was bad. Yes. She said that Mrs. Dell seemed to need to be a victim. Right. So she, she's spinning out of control. So when she talked to Cheryl about leaving, Cheryl took an, an overdose of antidepressant medication and was taken to the hospital and then released. So Gay stayed. Of course. Of course. Yes. Yes, because she was concerned about the children. Of course. She said, the only reason I remained in the relationship was because of the kids. In fact, a psychiatric report ordered by family court in January of 94 said that the three adults in the love triangle. Oh, no. Out of all the three adults, out of all of the, all three of them, that Gay had the best interaction with the children. Wow. Yes. I guess that's where her nunnery took. Skills, yeah. right. So... Anyway, so there was a doctor that wrote some notes that said that Mrs. Dell was inclined to believe she is above conventions or ethics of society mm -hmm. and acts accordingly without considering the consequences of her actions. Right. Although she is likely to be rather gregarious and outgoing on her first impression, huh. she does not relate very well to other people. Does she, not play well with others. She tends to be guarded and harbor chronic feelings of bitterness and resentment. She's highly sensitive to criticism, and to avoid rejection, she becomes adept in manipulating and lying. Wow. She suffers from long-standing personality difficulties marked by traits of immaturity, grandiosity, manipulativeness, and self-centeredness. I mean, she is selfish hoback. She is selfish hoback. I mean, come on. She is like, she's a narcissist. She crazy. She cry cry. He, so, of course, Scott, Dell, the husband, suffered endlessly, you know, because of all of the stuff that she did to him. And um, it really took a toll on him, and he ended up having cancer. Oh, I know. He ended up having a growth on the side of his neck, and they decided that it was, um, it was cancer. So he had, he had to go through, it was tongue and throat cancer. Oh, no. So... He's, he is 
fighting cancer every day, she's still, she's not giving up. Like, she's still, like, she's, she doesn't care that he has cancer. She's still the victim. Of course she is. Yes. So, he started, because he was going to lose his, probably his tongue Ugh. to cancer, and he would eventually not be able to speak at all. Right. He decided that he was going to start recording himself reading bedtime stories Aww. so that when he could no longer do that or when he was gone, his children would still be able to hear his oh voice my gosh. and read. I mean, this man is such a saint. This is hard. I know. I just, golly day, Scott Dell. Scott Dell. So he was really committed to surviving cancer for his kids. He was really committed to getting better and to do whatever he could to make his kids life better and he fought it and fought it radiation took its toll on his teeth and they began to rot oh no yeah so his mother ended up coming up from connecticut that's in the united states thank you mm -hmm. yeah. to help look after the children mrs dell cheryl cheryl she was she was not a Porter at all. Go figure. She didn't help with the children during this time. I'm sure. Yes. Like even when his children needed to be picked up from daycare because he was going through treatments or surgeries, she wouldn't show up. It's just not nice. She's not nice. So anyway, she said that um, she was devoted, a devoted supporter of her husband's um, <laughs> in his darkest hours of and course. that yes. and that caring for him was torture. I'm sure. It's yes. really hard on her. Exactly. He never complained about Cheryl. He never complained about her. Didn't say anything bad about never her. Never would say anything bad. He underwent surgery, got out of surgery, went back for checkups. He was proud of himself. He lost 50 pounds. He lost a lot of his teeth. They had to be recapped, mm. like his teeth and everything. He really went through it. So he did... He wrote, so he was very happy. He beat the cancer. Oh, way to go. Yeah. It, I mean, he didn't come out of it like he went into it. No, but, but he still he had lived, his life. He lived. And he wanted to live for his children, and that's what he did. He did write. He liked to write notes a lot. And so he wrote, we forget all the time that our life is a gift that has been given to us to enjoy, not to waste. So some people threw a party for him, and... His life was good. Life was good. Yeah. Um, his wife eventually lost Gay. She moved out. Right? She right. took on another one. Brought another lesbian lover in. He didn't complain because he felt like she needed somebody to love her. Sure. So. Well, and you know, he's oh. now probably doesn't look all that great from his cancer. And I'm sure they, he probably had some guilt. Yeah, and by now, Gay actually had befriended Scott. I love that. I think yes. that's a great theory. I think they kind of paired together. They had a really good friendship because I think she felt bad for him and saw all the horrible things that she did, and she saw his love for his children, and right. she had that same love. And so they kind of, you know, she kept in touch with him. She moved out of Canada and went to the United States and still kept in touch. Mm -hmm. So that was, you know, that was really good. Now, um, Cheryl has taken on a lover named Nancy Fillmore. Okay. Welcome yep. to the rodeo, Nancy. Yep. She was 37 years old. She had placed an ad in their newspaper looking for a relationship. Looking for love. Yeah. I'm looking for love in all the wrong yeah. places. They started writing letters to each other, speaking by telephone, and then they just, she, of course, told all of the horrible things that have happened to her and Nancy Fillmore just falls in love with her. Of course so, she does. Of yeah. course. So she decides to pay Cheryl a visit and surprise her oh. in June of 95. She arrived unannounced. Oh no. <laughs> while Scott was visiting. Oh no. And Cheryl was very cold to her. It was pretty much a disaster, except Nancy ended up taking everyone out to dinner before returning to Ottawa. Where are these people's brains? Right. Like, who's, do, who, 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 who's so thinking? So I've come to surprise you, and you've treated me like a like shit. shit. And now I'm going to take you to dinner. 
And the biggest surprise is that your husband, who you say is a horrible person, is visiting you. <laughs> yeah. And now you're going to give me the cold shoulder. Yeah. Nancy Fillmore was still interested in Cheryl. So she came back on Canada Day weekend and they went to the fireworks and she met the kids and she got along and she said, you know, I, I slept with her. Oh. Yeah. So. Oh, right. I forgive you for being a bitch and for being, being with your husband and lying about him. So I'm just going to mosey on over. And yes. So, Cheryl decides that she's going to start house hunting. She she was renting, she was renting a home, and she decided she wanted to buy a house. Okay. Okay. So the um, real estate agent takes her out looking at all these beautiful homes, and she tells the agent that her husband was dying of cancer, and she would soon be the beneficiary of his estate. Oh no. Yes. And the real estate agent believed that Mrs. Fillmore was going to be a partner in the purchase and would provide the down payment. And then Cheryl would be able, with the benefits, would be able to live. Right. So they were, like they were partners. He thought they were partners. Partners. Yes. Then she applied for the mortgage, but she, <laughs> she put the farmhouse up for collateral. Oh, no. And told them that her husband would soon be dead of cancer. And then she would be able to use that as collateral to buy the new house. Wow. She's setting it up. She certainly is. Yes. So she she comes back or she she's she starts having headaches and she starts having she's she's having some bone structure problems. Hmm. But she suffered from headaches and, and body pains. And she was always saying that something was very, very wrong. She was very sickly. That she, she thought she had asthma. <laughs> yeah. So she's telling everybody, like, I'm very, very sick. I, you know, I'm, I'm, and so just she actually well. mentioned to somebody, I wish my husband's cancer would just hurry up and kill him. Oh, golly. Yes. Because then she would be able to get the farmhouse and then she could turn it into a home for unwed mothers. Oh, that makes Or a sense. bed and breakfast. Whatever. Yeah, or both. Maybe both. I don't know. <laughs> so the whole time she's doing this, she's actually cozying up to Scott. He has no idea. Oh, I know. Poor thing. So um, he would visit her and she would talk to him in these like really sweet tones and people would overhear her like, Love talk and sweet talk oh, and no. yeah, I know it's so bad. So, but then he would leave and then she would jump up and down literally and throw a fit and say, he has to die. He's got to die of his cancer. Why is his cancer not taking him? Does anybody know how I can get rid of him? <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, she was, she was crazy. People around her were like, okay. So she starts to cozy up to him and it's July and, and she has a fall. She falls off a skateboard. <laughs> yeah. Okay. And she goes home and she's got a cast on her leg. These people, the Knots who owned her rental house, uh -huh. they kind of took her in and helped take care of her. And so, so Gay said in October of 95, when she lived in Texas, that Cheryl would call to say she was planning to buy a house and sell the farmhouse, which she would inherit when he died. And she fully expected him to die soon. Mm. Yes. Actually, Gay ended up coming back from the States and testifying at the trial against Cheryl. <laughs> I'm really glad she did that. Yes. So anyway, she just keeps pulling some really weird things. And the cat, her cat all of a sudden dies very suspiciously. Her cat. Her cat, Asia. Aww. And she said that, well, the knots who were taking care of the cat for her said that the cat was out on the lawn being really strange, and all of a sudden, the cat started having convulsions. Oh, no. They took it to the vet. The cat died, but they found that the cat had been poisoned with antifreeze. Oh, no. Yes. And at that point, Cheryl asks Mr. Knott to please use his visa to pay for the vet bill. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And I'm sure he said, okie doke. 
Yeah. I think that the voodoo dolls that she has maybe are the ones that are making all these great things happen for her. Yes. Yes. So she starts talking to the knots a lot about antifreeze. And Mr. Knot, in a conversation, does say, you know, I heard it's got a very sweet taste. Mm -hmm. And she that was very intriguing to her. He had told her about this case where somebody had mixed antifreeze and orange juice and had killed somebody with it. Oh, gosh. So now it's in her head. So now, Scott, we're going to go back to Scott. Okay. Oh, Scott. He decides it's, it's, he's ready to have a girlfriend. Okay, he's, he's given up on love with Cheryl. Finally. Yes. And he actually gets involved with a lady named Sue. She was from Toronto. He should stay out of Toronto. I mean, I'm sure Toronto is very nice, but Cheryl has tainted Toronto yeah, for Scott. She, yeah, I think I'd steer clear of Toronto. Yes, absolutely. So he starts kind of dating her. Mm -hmm. You know, he's he shows up very well-groomed. He's um, he's well dressed. He would take her out dancing. They would talk. He was a complete gentleman. Aww. So um, they started kind of a long distance relationship, and they would visit each other every third Wednesday or every third weekend, and they would talk on the phone. And you know they were getting along really well. Mm -hmm. um, people could see that Scott was very happy with his new relationship. Okay. Okay. So, guess who's not happy with his relationship? Well, I can imagine that yes. it would be his wife. This lady, Sue, I mean, he takes her to a family vacation in Connecticut. Like, he takes her all over the place, but he still couldn't leave Cheryl. He couldn't leave her. So, it's very frustrating to Sue. And she says in mid November, we gotta take some time off and you gotta figure out the Cheryl situation because I can't be in your life if Cheryl is in your life and she's draining you of your money and I don't like the way she treats your kids and I don't like the way she treats you and I don't understand why you can't just leave her. Just leave her behind. Just so get Sue just be done. Sane. Sue, like, Sue she is sane. Good old right. sane Sue. Yes. So Christmas came, spent Christmas with Cheryl's family and the kids because the kids were all together. So he was wherever the kids were, right? Right. And so then he had a really good time and he and the Cheryl's sister, Gail, said he actually looked better than he had in years. So she was really actually happy for him that it looked like that he was back to his health and he was happy and all that kind of stuff. Right. So anyway, I what happens is Scott dies, right? Right. He okay. had the wine. She claims that he um, committed suicide oh. by poisoning himself. Oh. Right. And the defense attorney actually uses this in court. Okay? Okay. He says he's been on welfare more than three years, hasn't had any job prospects. He was told he was cancer-free, but he was not. Oh. Yes. And and he was not told that he and he was told he was never going to be cured. Oh, so that's what they're saying. I don't think any of that was true. He noted that one of the last things that he wrote was "Goodbye, cruel world." Oh, yes. So it says. So what he really said was, "I was probably supposed to have died, but my life was spared. I don't know why, and that bothers me." Oh. Yes. So they use that in court to say he definitely killed himself. It was not Mrs. Dell. Oh. Yes. But the the state or the I don't think I think they call it the royal crown or the those you know, the people. The people. The people yes. the important people. Yes. They said that the coroner stated that originally stated that he died of cancer, but then when they found no evidence of cancer in his body. Then they looked further and said, no, he actually died from antifreeze poisoning. Uh-oh. Yes. I wonder if Mr. Knotts was in the courtroom and he thought, oh, shit. I know. I ought not to have said that. There's a trial. She's 
very flippant about the final conversation with her husband, you know, about all the nine hours of, and what he wrote, you know, all the love right. notes that he wrote and everything. And she said, I, I think he was just drunk. <laughs> yeah. And also, she actually um, tried to get him cremated really quickly before an autopsy could be conducted. And the reason that she said that is she didn't want any doctors poking at his corpse <laughs> because she loved him so much. Of course. Exactly. So anyway, the eldest daughter testified in January of 96 that she heard her mother say to her lover, Nancy Fillmore, I knew exactly what Gay Doherty was going to find when she went out to the farm. Because oh. Gail, I guess Gail, Gay, was, Gay is the one that found him. Right. Yeah. So, so they, they went to trial. They're at trial, and they talk about all the custody crap that she pulled on him. So she, she was at a detention center, and she supposedly confessed to her bunkmate that she killed her husband. Oh. And she said, I put antifreeze in his wine. What is it with jail, jail inmate confessions? Like, yes. Oh. She... Mrs. Dell was known in prison as Angel. Oh. And she took it as she was the angel of death. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, in nine, March of 97, Nancy Fillmore told police that she bought the wine and the antifreeze and that Cheryl had concocted the murder weapon or the murder concoction before her eyes. So Nancy was in on it? Nancy, yes, Nancy. Did. Damn it, yeah. Nancy. Yes. At first, Cheryl wanted Nancy to shoot Scott during hunting season, <laughs> but Nancy said that wasn't a good idea. So they end up, they, I mean, they, this is just, I mean, it's like they're just throwing out ideas. Like, how, how else can we kill him? If the cancer's not going to take him, maybe you can shoot him. Oh, no. Well, maybe we'll poison him. I heard that. That's an easy option. <laughs> So, yeah. Oh, oh my gosh. Yes. Well, you figure out. I'm, I'm trying to. I'm pulling the last batch of cookies out of the it oven. It smells so good. And I'm eating like 10 of them. You can't eat 10 of them. I can eat as many as I want because I'm in the kitchen. <laughs> Nancy Fillmore actually told police she knew about Scott's final words to his wife. Right. He was saying. You're here with me. I can see your angel spirit. But she she probably was hallucinating. <laughs> he probably was hallucinating. Sure, of course. Yes. And she kept just saying, just, I think you're losing your mind. Just have another drink. Oh, no. Yes. So she was like, keep drinking, honey. Exactly. There is a fire in August of 97. And Nancy Fillmore dies. Oh, it's Nancy. a fire in her apartment. And guess who faces charges for that first-degree murder? It's Cheryl. Oh. She paid somebody to kill Nancy Fillmore. Was this while she was on trial? This is while she was, yes, on trial. Wow. And in prison. Yes, while That's she was being housed. That's very ballsy. Yes. She had hired this dude named Mr. Crawford who said, I go to Nancy Mills, Mill, Fillmore's house, find her drunk and passed out on the floor with all of the candles lit. So instead of cutting her neck like I was instructed, I just flipped over the tables and left the candles to burn. Okay. Yes. And when he said, what's in it for me? She said, I'll give you a motorcycle and $300. Oh, a motorcycle and $300. Yeah, that's wow. what it took. Yes. Wow. So anyway, she ends up actually being, she ends up being prosecuted and found guilty of Nancy Fillmore's murder as well. I kind of so. wonder if she killed people before all of this that we don't know about. Yes. Oh. I mean, no. Oh. <laughs> I'm saying yes, I wonder. I, you, you, you it makes know. you wonder. Right. Right. So anyway, she said, Scott asked me if he would go to heaven and stuff like that. And I'd still say, like, I wasn't his judge as far as heaven goes. If, you, if you're real sorry, you should still go, right? Like, if you understand what you did and you're, and you, like, really in your heart, you regret it with all your heart, you still go to prison, you still go to heaven. Well, she was sentenced to life in prison with possibility of parole. See, in, in Canada, you get life imprisonment, but after 
25 years, you can come up for parole. Right. Even if it's life in prison. Wow. But they gave her no chance for parole. No, I'm sorry. After 15 years, if you get life in prison, uh -huh. after 15 years, you can go in front, you can petition. It's a hope and faith petition and, right. and you can petition to have to get to get out after 15 years mm -hmm. if you can prove that you've stayed out of trouble and you've done good things in prison so she was told that she can't apply for that until 25 years right i, I can i can see that because she killed somebody else right exactly so she's in prison for however many years life in prison with no chance of parole for 25 years, but after 25 years, she can still petition to get out. Right. So, and there's no, I don't know what happened to her children. I have no idea. I think. So, I, I, we I, need to add this to our prison tour, yes? I'm going to say, I don't think I even want to. Yeah. I If I go to Canada, I don't want to see that. I want to go visit the good parts of Canada, yes. not the parts that she has tainted. Yeah. Because... And I'm not sure that I want to go to this hippie town because I'm not sure how to buy things because I don't have anything to barter or trade with. Right. And I get the whole log cabin thing on a lot of acres, but it seems not as cozy as I thought. I understand. So I'm going to want to stay maybe in a high-rise hotel with some security. Yes. <laughs> if somebody can make that happen. Oh, yeah. And I don't, I'm not saying I don't ever want to go to Toronto, but I'm just saying... This woman tainted Toronto for me. A little bit, yeah. Because it but does I seem... I feel in Toronto is a great place. I hear it's wonderful. I think my daughter went there one time for New Year's Eve. Oh. So, yeah. Anyway, I am going to tell you that that was a, that was a hard murder. I'm sure. Oh there was gosh. so many twists and turns, and that woman was so busy. She was busy. She was a very busy bitch. Busy bitch. Yeah, From I don't hell. like it. So, anyway, Canada, I hope I didn't disappoint you. And on that note, I want a cookie. cookie. <laughs> Yay, cookie, cookie, cookie. There you go. Oh my gosh, they're so pretty. They I, are I do a really good job. You do. <laughs> You're good at the cookie. Oh gosh, they, God, they smell, smell so good. good. Okay, I'm going to eat one. It's like fall in your mouth. Mm. No, it's not. It's, it's like not. yummy pumpkin any time it's of year in your mouth. Delicious any time pumpkin. Don't anytime. put pumpkin in a closet. I won't. I'm so sorry. Mm, I just didn't really mean good. to. Okay. We gotta go. We do. Mm. It's been a long time. Yeah, I'm I'm exhausted. Yeah, me too. I've been to Canada and back. I'm gonna have a cookie. You have a cookie. I'll have a cookie. Cheers. Bye. All right, guys. Stay sweet, y'all. Thanks so much for listening. Okay. Bye, bye. now. Dunkin' Cold Coffee can be brewed at home in your Keurig coffee maker with Dunkin' Cold K-Cup Pods. Just brew it hot over ice and enjoy flavor that's crafted to serve cold. The home with Dunkin' is where you want to be.